thank everyone for joining us here tonight. My name is Pete Eberly, and I'm with the Colorado Renewable Energy Society. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with CRESS, um, we and our local chapters provide education, policy advocacy, and community engagement that accelerate Colorado towards a carbon neutral future powered by 100% renewable energy. Founded in 1996, CRESS is a statewide nonpartisan 501c3 organization that's supported by sustaining members, donation, as well as our business members. You can sign up for our newsletter, find out more about the organization, find our social media links, uh, or become a member or donor at www.cres-energy.org, C-R-E-S-energy.org. Um, also make sure to click on the link through to our YouTube channel where you will find uh, eventually this presentation as well as over 200 previously recorded videos that have so far racked up a little bit over uh, 1.3 million views. So we actually have a lot of following on the YouTube. Um, Want to give some special thanks to our Gigawatt business sponsors, Vista Engineering Group, Poudre Valley Rural Electric Association, Kelly Government Solutions, and Moss Adams. Um, also want to give a special thanks to the Colorado Green Building Guild, Passive House Rocky Mountains, and the Passive House Network, who helped get out the, the word on tonight's presentation. A um, little housekeeping before we get started. Uh, we will take Q&A at the end of the presentation, um, and you can put your questions into the question pane on the GoTo control panel, and then I'll just go top to bottom on those. Um, so without uh, further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Andrew Mitchler of Hyper Local Workshop. Andrew. Pete, thanks. Thanks for the invite and um, congratulations on these great, um, this great series going online. Uh, it's not quite the same as being in a brewery, but uh, will suffice. Hopefully everybody has a drink and to enjoy it. Uh, today we're going to talk about this uh, Passive House project we've been working on for the fire rebuild from the um, Marshall Fire and um, and uh, kind of where we are with that, how we got there and hopefully where we'll be going. Um, but I'm going to jump first into kind of a little bit about my bio and get a little bit into um, the idea behind Passive House and fire resilience and kind of the larger climate change issues and how we build uh, for those conditions uh, using the term resilient design. You're probably going to hear resilient design a lot more uh, uh, when it comes to buildings as, as we find out that uh, fires and floods and heat waves and cold snaps are, are being more intense and global weirding. So why, how are buildings responding to that? A um, little bit about myself. I am a certified Passive House consultant. Um, I'm part of the Passive House Rocky Mountains chapter and also served on the board of the National Passive House Network. And um, I've been doing it for a number of years now. Um, I actually began my building career, interestingly enough, just in the context of tonight's conversation, uh, building, help, helping restore a house after my family's house burned in the 1991 Oakland Hills fire, where we lost about 2,800 homes. So um, I've been thinking about fire a long time. And part of that is because uh, my first passive house up here in the foothills, uh, just outside of Fort Collins Loveland area, uh, is in a ponderosa pine forest as a passive house. So uh, design took a lot of those lessons on on how we were designing this house and extended out and how to build passive houses generally in wooey areas, uh, which means wildland urban interface uh, and how these are basically a, a substantial part of where we build in the West is fire prone areas. And so we need to think uh, not just individually, but in the terms of neighborhoods and communities on how to build around fire. So after the Marshall fire, that was an interesting time to really um, examine it quite closely. Um, so quick, quickly, this is where I live. I live in the foothills. You can see this is a Cameron Peak fire that went up right to the very edge of our property. Uh, basically. Um, so we've we've had quite a few fires on the mountain that I live in. Fire is a natural part of where we live and adapting to it should be a normal part of how we design. Uh, but the fires, of course, are getting much more intense, uh, as we know now, and happening at times that we never thought we'd see them. Um, 
I do lots of passive house projects, mostly uh, mountain projects, uh, some urban projects. Um, uh, probably have maybe a good dozen or so on the boards now, and uh, interest is growing substantially with passive house. So that's really exciting to see uh, it flourish as a building system and that people understand. Um, in the terms of the fire, where the Camera Peak fire happened, um, you know, uh, it was quite a shock. I think they lost about a thousand homes, in Boulder County. And then um, after the fire, with the rebuilding, pretty quickly, um, when the fire started happening, was that uh, Excel Energy uh, decided to rebate $37,500 for if you built a certified passive house. And then the governor's energy office, I'm sorry, just the energy, Colorado energy office, uh, added another $10,000 for the all electric home. So all of a sudden we had about $50,000 uh, uh, to work with in terms of uh, building passive house out for people. So that at least helped start the conversation. Part of the reason why uh, just jumping back into the kind of larger issue around buildings, buildings are a significant part of kind of what the climate change issues that we're dealing with uh, socially. Um, building operations is about 28% of all atmospheric carbon and materials and construction materials is uh, about 11%. Um, another way to think of that is that um, the upfront carbon is like day one, you built a house, that's your carbon footprint. But as you, as you occupy the building, the more the energy you use every year, um, even with a renewable grid, a grid that's becoming more renewable, it's not renewable yet. It won't be for quite a long time, 100%. So that, so that, so if this is your total uh, carbon for the building of the building. Uh, over the years, the actual energy use of the building uh, can outstrip the upfront carbon in the building, and then actually become a significant, if not the most significant, personal impact you have on uh, atmospheric carbon. Uh, in your personal life and is where you live. So um, we're, we really need to directly uh, approach that problem with the design of the buildings. Got to try to get out of some of these uh, slides earlier, but I can't quite make the show work right. So apologies for a little bit jumping back and forth. Um, so, how does that come back to the fire problem? So, so first we need to build low carbon everything, obviously, uh, starting with our buildings, how we built them, what we built them with, and how much energy they use. Then on the resilience side, um, you know, the first thing is like, let's just build concrete buildings. Well, concrete buildings don't necessarily save you from fire. Uh, we've had plenty of concrete buildings burn uh, just as well as wood buildings, it turns out, because they can be very vulnerable for design issues around them, wildfire conditions. So um, in that sense, and how we are thinking about rebuilding communities um, around fire buoy areas, especially now in cities and suburbs, is starting with simple shapes, starting with a place where the fire resilience has, the fire has less places to actually get in contact with the house, less nooks and crannies, less places for, uh, debris to build up, um, less places for eddies to form and to uh, allow flame and heat sources to get into the building fabric. And you can see uh, just in a in a very um, very dramatic way how like wind driven fires like the Cameron Peak fire was that the more complex the building is, the more little spots that you can create uh, for embers to lodge inside the building. Um, and so that's kind of the first principle is just the four, what we call the form factor of the building. And the second thing is looking, re reducing uh, kind of the debris, we won't call it the debris, but kind of the infrastructure around the building, including plantings and decks and fencing. The less actual, I call them wicks. So if a fence starts is on fire and it goes right up to your siding, then it can, it's a perfect way to bring a fire condition from the side of the property deep into uh, the core of the property and right against the building. So, and the same with um, vegetation uh, being smart around that perimeter of the house 
and we call them zones A, A, B, C, or one, two, three, however you look at it. Uh, the first zone should be as fire resilient as possible. Second zone should just be uh, low, low fire, uh, fire prone materials. Um, that's a simple design thing. Obviously, most of our neighborhoods are full of fences and decks. So now we're finding out how vulnerable that really makes the homes. And we can do hardscaping, some softscaping on the exterior, proper plantings. Uh, this is very basic guidance. And it's very subtle things that can bring a, fi a fire into to a house. Um, when we look at kind of neighborhood design, we can see how entire neighborhoods can be defense spaces uh, towards wildfire conditions. Uh, we found in Cameron Peak Fire and Oakland Fire, all sorts of these urban fires, Colorado Springs, that uh, one fire, one house actually often leads to the next house on fire. So the more we uh, create one resilient or a pocket of resilient homes within a community that protects the other homes around it. Um, so it's, a, it's a very much a group effort. Uh, the building itself um, is interesting in the sense that fire, we often hear about getting into attics. Uh, this is the way it gets an attic. Hot air gets into the eve of the attic, into kind of the most vulnerable place where you have maybe often like uh, paper or uh, like building paper. You can have often just framing things that are very vulnerable to burning right there. Even the baffles are made out of foam or plastic. So, so the first thing we do, especially in passive house, is re reduce or eliminate the actual attic space and build uh, primarily cathedral ceilings. Most of my projects are cathedral ceilings. And if we can't do that, uh, develop um, systems where we're reducing the amount of air that get, get in there in doing uh, using ember uh, ember breaking uh, or spark arresting ventilation if that's uh, the only choice we have. Um, I go through these quickly. Turns out the windows are primary way that fire has been getting into buildings. So big heat front can actually crack windows, break windows. Uh, so it turns out the passive house, especially with tempered triple pane windows, is often uh, much, much better at uh, re reducing that first fire front uh, that creates that cracked window syndrome. So if you build a concrete house, but you put in poor windows, the concrete can stay, but the fire can get right through uh, vulnerable places like windows into the building. So, so resilience and high performance come together. Uh, the synergies come together quite quickly there, or quite uh, succinct, succinctly there. Uh, materials, of course, uh, foam is, is no go, no bueno when it comes to fire, even if they put fire resilient materials in it, uh, that certainly is kind of a stopgap measure. Uh, we look at cellulose and and mineral, mineral wool insulation. Cellulose actually is dense packed, so it doesn't let much air in. Uh, mineral wool is inherently fire proof, basically. Uh, here's my project, just kind of a, where I started on the fire resilience side, looking at uh, the eaveless or having, having eaves that are protected, having cathedral ceilings, uh, airtight boundary, which is classic passive house design. And then this is the mineral wool uh, with a cement board on top of that. So, and then um, steel. So kind of all the basics with a simple form factor. So those are, those are kind of the starting point of where I learned uh, to build fire resilient passive house. Let's turn that off. And then uh, we come to this, which is, which, which is the uh, restore passive house that uh, I've been working with, um, with, uh, an architect out of Seattle, Rob Harrison, Harrison Architects, and with the builder uh, Chuck Bauer and Jobert, um, Jobert uh, Homes. Basically, they're kind of a high-end uh, home builder. And Harrison is a custom passive house architect, lots of experience. Um, and the challenge for us was that um, we wanted to build in the community of a, we wanted to provide, um, take advantage of that grant for Passive House and um, provide a project that was pre-designed for people and was affordable for people. So this was something that people could quickly get into 
uh, essentially, and be able to afford, given uh, the limited um, funds that a lot of them are finding, a lot of them were upside upside down or underwater, I should say, from the insurance. So um, that was the kind of the first the first aspect of designing the home. And the second aspect was how do we design a uh, project in Colorado, a passive house that could be certified, but could be um, quickly modified uh, for each lot without doing substantial redesign work. So that was the challenge. Uh, we decided to look at the Sagamore neighborhood, um, which is a uh, kind of a mid 90s um, project. Uh, about 200 homes were built there in the mid 90s uh, by one of the large national builders. So really, really narrow lots, um, very compact spaces, uh, limited solar exposure, um, things like that. And uh, so that so that was one of the kind of key constraints on on how do we provide for that community. So this is what we built it was the uh, um, restore passive house. Um, basically, we've gotten quite a bit of coverage already for this project, um, and it's a, and it's a, basically a simple L-shaped home. And the idea is um, with passive house is that we want that simple form factor. In this sense, it's a well shape. Uh, we can build over the garage, but in, this, in the first project, we decided not to build over the garage. It's about 2,300 square feet with an upstairs, downstairs, and a full-size basement. And the price comes in, uh, the starting price with an unfinished basement is uh, $550,000 or so. Um, so that turned out to be um, really a pretty attainable price for a lot of people from our feedback um, and uh, in fact we're finding some energy star homes that came in a good hundred thousand dollars more than that uh, with a much lower performance and couldn't take advantage of the substantial grants um, so so that was a great first start um, uh, the basic the basic premise of the home also was that from a passive house point of view is that we, and I'll kind of show that in some different pictures. Here's the, to show you just quickly, it's a, this is the, one of the many floor plans we've been working on, but basically it's one long, large room that you enter into, central kitchen, little dining space in the front, little living space in the back, uh, multi-use room, potential bedroom, got ADU, not ADU room, but kind of a age in place type of room on downstairs with a bathroom. Upstairs, uh, three bedrooms. Uh, with, uh, with the master suite having its own bathroom. Pretty typical stuff, you know, no surprises uh, to it. And then a pretty good sized um, downstairs um, basement. Um, again, for small lots, so uh, limited availability uh, or ingress. And I shouldn't say ingress, little, little, little space to, to move to make it much bigger than this outside of building over the garage, which has some issues to it. Um, and then make a make a home that that felt um, very simple, very contemporary, uh, but but not over designed, so to speak. Uh, so something that didn't feel kind of fussy or uh, cute. Right. So that's something uh, I think is important. Uh, architectural expression of uh, making making a home that fit in to kind of an urban, but still wooey uh, Colorado lifestyle thing, whatever, whatever, however they sell houses nowadays. Just a quick views of how the project's coming together. Obviously houses are right next to it in the real world. Um, some renderings, we had some great help with uh, Michael, uh, Michael and Gorman Fritchard name last night, right now, but we had some great help from all sorts of folks putting this together. Interior, again, very, um, not not a big wide space that we could work with with the lot, but we extended out uh, the, the floor of it to, to build that out. Uh, we have open staircase, uh, again, to create a open aired environment. And large kitchen. And, from a passive house point of view, how do we what what we turned out 
having to do was the idea behind the L is that in Colorado, the main issues that we're dealing with um, for uh, Passive House, it turns out, and I've done quite a few uh, here as far as energy modeling, is that we're actually in one of the best conditions in the country uh, to build these things. Uh, the reason why uh, we haven't seen that in the past few days, but the solar heat gain that we have in the state is extremely significant. We have somewhat warm days in the winter, and cold nights, and by far we're per, we're dominated by heating. Heating is the main issue with uh, with I shouldn't say issue, but that's the main uh, energy load on our homes. So by working with reducing the heating uh, through various means using passive house methodologies around what we call the fabric first or envelope insulation, air tightness, things like that. And then secondary by using good solar thermal solar gains in the house. These aren't passive solar houses per se. We don't need a whole bank of windows everywhere, but we do need some good solar gains. So that's the long way of saying what the idea of the L shape is that for each and every lot in the Sagamore community was that we could flip the house to get better Southern exposure so that we could, this, this project's slightly different, but typically uh, the idea is that, um, is that we can get this wall further away from the neighbor's house to get good solar exposure. This lot actually turned out to be just like this. So this would be South. Uh, facing down. So we ended up getting quite a bit of solar gain from uh, the back of the home and from the side of the home. So we didn't have to flip it uh, to to provide uh, the passive house um, performance with it. We also ended up getting quite a bit of solar gain from the front of the house. That's good because they're requiring to have us uh, quite a bit of um, glass in the front of the house just uh, for uh, neighborhood um, ordinances, design design ordinances. Um, what I'm showing you now is a SketchUp model. SketchUp is a 3D design tool, and what we can do is draw the building inside of this 3D model with the neighbors, and we can run a preliminary energy model using a, a program called Design PH. And this is going to tell us uh, pretty close how much energy the building's going to use for heating and where critically where the shading around the building is. These buildings become very sensitive towards shading in that case. What do we do with that? In this house, this is our first project that we have a contract for. It's called the Rupert project. We we get a um, we get an energy model. And uh, and this in this case, uh, this is the what we call the um, summary page for Passive House, and we get we're given a very strict energy budget. In this case, it's of 4.75 uh, kBTUs kilowatt kilowatt uh, uh, BTUs um, per square foot, and it's the same for heating and cooling annually. So that's so that energy density uh, we can use as a value that we compare different buildings um, of the same type or different types or buildings all across the world. Passive House is a universal building standard. And so it uses the same metric of amount of energy budget we're allowed to use around the world, but it's also very, very site specific. And it starts with the climate. In this case, we're using Denver's climate. Uh, we have a very robust climate model that we use here, and it uses the site. And as you can see with the shading and the direction of the building orientation, windows, all those things. So it's a very dynamic model. So it gives us a very tight budget of energy, and then we decide within the local conditions uh, how we're going to build that building. Um, in this case, we had a very narrow lot, so we needed somewhat thin walls, relatively thin walls for what a passive house was. So we had to play some tricks to get below that 4.75. Um, at the end of the day, and this is what's kind of fascinating about um, Passive House. Let me find it. Let me see if I can find the heating load chart. I just added it earlier. 
there it is, annual heating. There it is. So, so this this little chart right here, this is this is just the energy balancing uh, chart. It tells us what our energy budget is for the building and where we lose energy. Summary of where we lose energy in the home, where we gain it. And this is fundamental for when I describe how the house works. And we most of those questions we're getting from clients is 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 um is the thing really comfortable do you really need just this little teeny heating source for this to work so th so 6.8 this is this bright yellow is our solar heat gain for the home the the next the next orange part is the internal heat gain and that's counted as part of how the home is heated significantly in, in most cases um, and then the heating demand is the bright red. So this is where we're bringing in um, energy from the outside, from the grid, of course, and artificially heating the home. Uh, so this is our primary, our secondary, and our third source of heat becomes this. Um, as we add more insulation, as we optimize, this, this goes up, this goes down. As we add more insulation, this also goes up. Uh, for the internal heat gains. So, so there's a lot of back and forth on understanding the dynamics of thermal gains and losses for the building. And really it's round, not just um, the energy side, but also the comfort side. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the aspects of where this energy metric comes from actually comes not just to save energy and save the world, you know, eat your granola, but also for um, the well-being of the occupants. And that a lot of that comes around to the thermal comfort, creating a thermally neutral building and using relatively little drops in heat or you know how it can get the, the older buildings. You can imagine uh, when the furnace turns on, it gets really hot. And then furnace turns off, it gets really cold and you yo-yo quite a bit. That's really inefficient, uncomfortable, noisy, just not the way we need to build buildings in general. Um, the other side, of course, is through ventilation, uh, fresh air. I didn't get into that, into the fire talk, but it's one of the critical aspects of, of passive house and fire is that air tightness envelope means that where you putting in ventilation system and then the heat exchanger with the ventilation system, heat recovery ventilation system, we can actually uh, filter that air uh, coming into the home and um, providing another kind of way of uh, protecting occupants from not just smoke, which is a significant issue um, now, as we unfortunately in the summertime, but also um, through particulate matter and things like that from range air quality is getting significantly worse through the years. So that's the energy model. It goes on and on. Our values, you know, we have lots of inputs for things. Uh, we model it out in about 32 tabs, so we're essentially simulating the building in the model itself. And then how does that actually work? This is where kind of most of our conversations are on how does the building uh, work, say, on a, on a night like last night uh, here, where it's minus 10 degrees, minus 14 degrees. What are we doing? How do we use a heat pump? How are we still getting fresh air? Um, the first thing we do is um, we we the first part of what house these passive houses are is the is the fresh air recovery system, as I mentioned before. In this case, we're using uh, a unit called Brink, and I can pull that up real quick. So the first thing we do is we put in the heat recovery system. And the heat recovery or energy recovery system is the fresh air, quote unquote, not the lungs for the building, but this is for your lungs. Your building doesn't need to breathe. The building would prefer not to breathe. They prefer not to have wet, damp air going through the walls. You'd much prefer uh, to be left alone and that we source uh, fresh air to where the humans, to the occupants are. Uh, this is a new unit coming onto the market. We're doing our first install. Um, it's, it's not new for the U.S. market. It's been around in, it's a Dutch company. It's been around 
uh, in Europe for quite a number of years. This is one of their newer unit designs. But we can get these for a relatively affordable price. Uh, they're also PassPal certified, so they're about 92% energy efficient. So what happens is um, what they found out was that uh, the least less efficient these units were for fresh air, and say it was it was really cold, minus 16 uh, one night. Then you're getting cold air that's going into your rooms, especially like bedrooms. People would often shut these things off because of comfort. And so it's not just the energy efficiency of these um, that that makes them passive house applicable. It's also because they're putting in air that's very, very close to the ambient room temperature. Uh, so you don't feel a cold draft in the building. And you also don't hear the fans blowing. It's very quiet. So the people just leave them alone, change the filters. But outside of that, keep them on so you always have fresh air. Um, so that's what we first focus on is getting that system balanced, distribute air into the different rooms. So this is the calculation. So this is the plan set for how much air we're putting into each room and then how much we're extracting so mostly the bedrooms get fresh air and then we extract from bathrooms where it's moist air or kind of perfumed air I'll do that and um kitchens where we also do direct extraction for the kitchens so there's always a flow of air going through the house probably exchange air once every three hours or so. Um, so that's the first part of the building uh, as far as kind of the passive house in terms of comfort and quality air or comfort and quality of the interior. Second part, of course, is heating and cooling. In this case, we're using uh, two mini splits. We have one downstairs and one upstairs. And these are these are mini split heat pumps. And you, you there, people are talking about heat pumps a lot. Heat pumps are becoming quite popular, um, but they're, heat pumps are not all created equal and almost none of them are actually created equal. It turns out to be extremely um, difficult to design a heat pump that distributes air through a building without dramatically reducing either the, the efficiency of the heat pump or significantly raising the the installation costs of the heat pump. So to keep the price of the house down, uh, we chose uh, mini split heat pumps, which are kind of the cheapest form of heat pumps, but they also turn out to be the most energy efficient types of heat pumps. In um, Colorado, uh, turns out we can install heat pumps that work down to minus 22 Fahrenheit. Um, so you almost never see that uh, level of coldness in, um, of course, along the front range. Maybe in the mountains, uh, we see that, maybe in like a zone six or a zone seven, that's certainly possible. On top of that, in a passive house, even if the power shut off, we have kind of this latent uh, buildup of heat and we lose, and we slowly lose that heat rather than quickly lose that heat. So even at times when the heat pump can't quite keep up, you don't actually feel that in the building for a number of reasons, not just the ambient temperature, but because the radiant temperature of the walls and windows are somewhat neutral. So you don't feel it against your cold skin. Um, so that's, again, part of the, very much a part of the comfort side of it. Using these specific units, these are, this is called Medea um, heat pumps. Uh, that's, uh, they don't have the brand name on it. That's the part number. Um, these act, of course, for cooling the house and heating the house. We do have active cooling in the passive house. We also made it so that you can open windows for cross breezes um, when you want to and can uh, for passive cooling, which is great. Uh, certainly don't want to do that in summer when the air quality is really bad. So unfortunately now more than ever, we're becoming really dependent on cooling, active cooling. Uh, this, these ideas and the big reason why we chose these uh, they're also carrier in the United States, carrier badged um, product. They have a COP or um, or um, the amount of energy that you put into it, how much the multiplier, how you get, how much you get out of it. And in this case, as we put in one unit of energy, 
we're getting a peak of four units of heat out of it or four units of cooling out of it. Um, that's at 47 degrees. Once it gets down to a chilly five degrees, we get a COP of two. Um, each of these units is just about big enough, but not quite because they're derated from altitude to heat the entire passive house um, in this case. But what we're doing is we're actually creating them so they can be zoned for upstairs if it gets a little too hot upstairs or it gets a little, uh, it needs to be warmed up downstairs, for instance, these things can be zoned uh, from upstairs and downstairs. Um, we're being pretty conservative on the first project, but uh, we may not have to. I did actually built a, finished a, another project in Colorado Springs where we're using 6,000 BTU units, and these are 9,000 BTU BTU units, and this is this is rated for the cooling. Uh, the heating is actually much a little bit higher for its rating, so it can go down to 3,000 BTUs and up to 19,000 BTUs per hour uh, per unit. Um, the entire passive house, in fact, speaking of the BTU devil, has a load peak load in the worst of conditions of 12,000 BTUs an hour. For the entire house. So one of these units should do, do just fine with it. Um, what's happening here is that the unit's just blowing air across this large space. And you may be wondering how this space is getting heated. Um, the bedroom, for instance, when the door is closed. And what we're doing um, is using the upstairs. You can load any time now, computer. Upstairs, we're actually using a very simple bath fan and, and in the central core of the space and providing a little bit extra boost into each of the rooms, downstairs and upstairs. Uh, so, and we'll also be able to um, calibrate each of those ducts into each of those rooms to make sure that they're getting sufficient heating or sufficient cooling uh, based on where they are. So we can actually adjust it uh, throughout the year or 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 commit basically able to commission the house so that's air that's coming in through both the ventilation system the heat recovery ventilation system and from a booster fan uh, being being supplied basically by this hallway plenum so to speak why go through all this because we're saving ten thousand dollars at least on the cost of the equipment installation and uh, we're saving uh, significantly on the efficiency of the system. Uh, these Medeas are substantially more energy efficient than uh, low volume um, flow uh, units, uh, uh, the units that go into the ceilings or the units that you, um, VRF units where you have multiple heads with one compressor. Um, all of those units drop in efficiency dramatically from the single mini split units. Um, so it's kind of the best of both worlds in that sense. And so what does this mean? So what, what we're trying to do is all of this work, all this thinking um, is to get back to the idea of an affordable mainstream passive house that can be applied to multiple conditions along front range and that can be changed quite quickly the interior design of it it can be changed quite quickly in the way that the windows take advantage of views take advantage of solar heat gains things like that but at the same time we're not re-engineering the house which is very expensive and redoing the documentation so we'd probably need to build about, I'm going to say at least five of these to break even just from uh, the design work that has gone into them. But at the same time, we've also been able to, you know, somewhat tap dance a little bit with the large production builders who are building kind of these code minimum houses that are very similar in price, but significantly more expensive in operation and probably not nearly as nice in finishes. And I would say guaranteed, certainly not resilient uh, for either fire conditions 
or when the power goes out, kind of all these other kind of aspirations we want for a sustainable building. Um, I didn't really mention that uh, one of the kind of fun things about the project is that um, it also provides us with a ton of solar panel rooms. So we can put small panels on, maybe we need just like a four kilowatt array to, to significantly uh, offset um, almost all the homes on-site energy usage. But if you have an electric car, I just bought an electric car myself and put a heat pump into a little place I have down in Santa Fe and my electric bill has quadrupled instantly. So we're actually going to need a lot more energy in the future, uh, demands in the future, as we electrify uh, our, our lives and our neighbors. So giving the potential to provide more PVs is part of that. But it's not primarily PV that the home works. The PV is kind of the, is the secondary measure. It's really about being adapted uh, to each and every site uh, and being uh, affordable so people actually um, build these things. Um, just kind of a, before I end, I'd, I'd love to do q and I'm sorry, I already went on for 45 minutes, but um, just kind of the last bit of news is that um, it looks like we have hopefully two new folks to sign on today. So we'll have three of these projects under contract and um, hoping that word spreads about how these buildings work, especially if we get the first one kind of uh, buttoned up and people get to see it, that this is something that they can afford to as fire victims, and that this is something that can be quite mainstream in the market. And the second part is that uh, we're hoping to, well, we're getting word that um, the TV show Nova uh, would like to uh, have a short piece on this project as well. So hopefully that comes through, they're doing a series on climate change and we're finding that we're getting a lot of conversation about accessible, high performance, low carbon building, that there's a significant uh, national awareness around that, especially when we put in uh, the concept of resilient design uh, on layered on top of all those kind of other aspects that this is becoming more mainstream and more accessible for people. So that's it for my, for my kind of scattered presentation. Uh, thanks for your time. Well, thank you, Andrew. Um, so I'll go ahead and jump into the questions here. Of course, I just closed that pane. Um, so the first one that I have is, can you uh, utilize a wood-burning stove in a passive house? You could, but only if you're really into suffering because a stove, as I said, the, the maximum BTUs that we need for the house in the coldest condition is uh, 12,000 BTUs. And I can't imagine a wood stove that's less than 20,000 BTUs. Um, so um, if you're doing it for entertainment, that's great until you overheat. So you make a little fire and then shut it off. It won't really need it for primary heat at all. Um, I do know of somebody uh, who built their built a passive house out in England. Um, he built, I think it's been six years now, and they just did a um, interview with him. He's a passive house architect, works for a great large firm that does uh, lots of commercial passive house. And when he built his own passive house, he had uh, this fellow Nick Grant um, work with him. Nick, Nick's a famous passive house consultant. And the biggest controversy was the wood stove. And Nick fought him tooth and nail not to put this wood stove in, which there are passive house wood stoves, actually. They're airtight. So they take the air from the outside, go through the combustion chamber and up through the flue. So you can get air, air passive house rated wood stoves, which they're expensive, as you can imagine. Um, but it turns out he never uses the thing. It, he, he wanted to uh, just up, get a little heat, but also just to be nice. And he says that was kind of his only real regret was putting a wood stove in it because of the expense and the lack of usability for it. So uh, put it, put a st I'm putting lots of um, units outside in my mountain projects, kind of like an outdoor living space, especially if people have lots of biomass around them. Just have a nice wood stove out there. Um, burn it when you when you want uh, to have that kind of experience, that whole hot cold experience, uh, and then jump into your passive house for the rest of the time. Uh, I live on a wood stove, uh, my other house, and let me tell you, 
I was I was splitting wood in my living room last night uh, with my wood log splitter. It was so goddamn cold, and we went through so much wood. There's a time when wood's just like terrible <laughs> as a heating source, at least for a primary. Okay, this question might be a little out of your, uh, but how much PV would be needed for an electric vehicle? Yeah, I don't know. It depends on how much you drive. It's all. Yeah, I think you know how big your our, battery is. <laughs> I'd say I'd say our percentage of where the house is, um, a car would be about three times the energy load of your house. For an average, say your say your battery is like I have a Tesla Model Y. It takes about 75 kilowatts hours to fill that battery. Uh, my house probably would use maybe five to 12 kilowatts a day maximum. So uh, maybe about twice as much as the house for a house this size. So that's a good point. I think transportation is going to be the next real big power suck as oh, we yeah. get our house better and better. Um, what is the, the plan for uh, managing and modeling the, the moisture within the house? I, in Colorado, front range, we don't really have to. Um, we're using, we're just using best practices. We're using the interior, we, our air barrier is using a product called Intello, which is a, um, which is a material that changes its um, vapor dynamic uh, based on kind of the condition, the, the relative humidity inside the wall. So if the wall starts getting loaded up in relative humidity, uh, it actually opens up to help the wall uh, get that moisture out. Um, but most of the time it's actually very vapor closed to kind of reduce the amount of interior vapor drive to the exterior. And then um, I didn't really get into that, but on our wall section, uh, we actually are using two inches of mineral board on the exterior of the building that goes over a plywood. So that plywood will be somewhat warm, quote unquote, kind of classic methodologies um, so that we don't uh, reduce um, condensation on that. Now, if I was doing this like in Steamboat Springs or in a colder climate, we'd start uh, being and we had more insulation in the walls. This is a fairly thin wall, it's two by eight with a two inch. So we're talking about maybe 11 inch total wall. So there's really not that much wall there to worry about. We're pretty close to code. Once we get into the mountains, it becomes much more concerning, especially if you have areas that don't warm up at all in the winter and spring, then we'll start doing uh, woofy modeling at that point, especially in the ceiling. Not so much the walls, but the ceiling, cathedral ceilings would require woofing modeling. And I have done whooping modeling before on the on this type of construction in the front range. And we came out okay. Um, question. Is the flat roof over the garage a place for embers to collect? And what about uh, roof leakage risks from the flat roof? Uh, it's not a flat roof. Technically, it's a pitched roof. It's just hidden up front. And yes, it is a it is a place for risk. Um, so we have non-combustional siding, and then we have the two inches of mineral wool, and then we'll have a metal roof and and insulation up to the roof roofing on the garage as well. But you're right there. That is kind of one of those risk zones right in there. So that's where we want to make sure that we don't have um, places for like material to be stored or definitely want people to like keep that clean and um, that's that's will have to be really well detailed so we don't so we have a good uh, good condition where even if there's a fire ember there um, that it won't get into the structure of the building um, and that that's even more of an issue around the entire perimeter of the house how to keep that perimeter uh, well well uh, conditioned because we we can't count on people not having grass growing next to their house you know in, in the in the not so distant future putting putting down bark stuff like that so so all those conditions 
have have not just the cladding, but the entire uh, wall assembly itself is fire resilient. Okay. Um, is there anything we can do to existing homes to make them both more firewise and more passive or improve performance? Well, that's a huge question. Yes. Um, the firewise things, the first thing is get anything around the home that can burn out off of that house. Decks, gates, things like that. Um, my mountain, we lost quite a number of homes. I think about 12 homes in the Cameron Peak fire. And almost none of those homes really were prepared uh, with the vegetation and materials that are around the specific home. Um, and then on, on, as far as like, the first thing I would really look at is the air tightness of your house. Um, a lot of homes uh, got fire smoke damage. Um, significant number of homes uh, from the fire for insurance coverage uh, were, were damaged by the smoke. And long-term health effects for you, just having a house where you don't have controlled air, um, and the short-term effects of that smoke damage uh, really was, was a significant issue. Mark Attard, uh is a passive house builder who um, did an interfit on his house. And his home was right across the street from from where the fire terminated, and he ended up being the only person on the entire block that could move right back into his house after the fire. Everybody else had such significant fire smoke damage. He says to this day, quite a number of them have not moved back in after a year of their homes. Um, and then just you know, there's an entire thing called interfit, which is a, a passive house a retrofit process that has um, two different paths to take. And it, it's a very cohesive, uh, long-term view at how to do a deep energy retrofit, not like a partial retrofit. And partial retrofits are turning out are don't save energy in the first place because people find out they're totally uncomfortable in their first house, so they didn't use that much energy. Once they started getting comfortable, they use more energy to maintain it comfortable. Uh, so, so we're finding out the partial retrofits are kind of like hybrid cars, you know. At first, it sounded like a good idea, but actually doesn't, if it's not used the way it, it was intended to, it could actually use as much energy or more energy due to Moore's law. So a little bit of a side note on that, but. Okay. Um, if you enclose the space above the garage, um, what would that look like roof, roof wise and how much yeah. would it add to the cost? Good question. And our next two projects have that room. This was our first stab at it. We thought that this house was big enough for people. I have no idea what the market wants because 2,300 square feet is considered small, even for these little teeny lots. So we put another 300 square foot house here. And I think what's happening is the roof goes along at an angle down to the edge of the garage. So you have like a sloped shed style roof that starts up here and comes down here. This room itself uh, is by far the most expensive room um, simply because of the extra amount of framing and the complexity to the passive house. I've not done the energy modeling, modeling on it either. So I'm not sure how much more uh, insulation we'll need. And depending on the conditions, these windows, if these were your solar windows here and it gets pushed out here and we shade the house because there's a building, like these lots, there's only 10 feet between these houses, which can go up to 32 feet. So it's, it's, a, it's a practical matter in that sense. Um, but uh, I, think, I think roughly it was added another $70,000 or $60,000 to the project uh, for that room. But if you need the space, and honestly, urban environments, uh, that's still pretty much the cost of most building nowadays, um, it's, it's an option. Okay. Um, what are the R values for the walls, ceilings, and windows? Yeah, I can show that, actually. Let's take a look at a section. We love sections. Let's do a section. All right. You want to share my screen? Pete? Uh, I think we're seeing it. Um, oh, you are? You're, okay, you're still the presenter, so yeah, I don't. Good, good. 
I can just see your beautiful face. So here's here's our wall system. It's a two by eight, and then two inches on the outside. This is blown cellulose. So this is, I think, an R. Ah, like an R50. And this is the ceiling, cathedral ceiling. Let me go to the different sheet. I go and go. I have the summary on the first page here. And I can also compare this to code for you. So, so the, the house itself is the attic space or the roof is an R80. And then above ground, our walls are um, in R30. Oh, that's not right. I think this is higher than R23. But uh, R33, I'm thinking for the wall. That sounds too low to me. Uh, floor insulation is an R26, and then the basement wall is an R24. Um, so in terms of, you can see these upper code numbers, so R60 for the roof, and then R20 plus 5, or R23 plus 10. Uh, floor insulation, uh, R30 in this case, which I actually think I put the put the wrong number down there. I think that's R19. Uh, we are R24 rather than R19 in our wall. I'm sorry, our walls, our floors are R26 rather than a 19. And our basement walls in R24 instead of 19. But that's um, <clears throat> that is so we're not that much higher than what a code is. And this is the PHP. This is the energy model. So our wall is actually, yeah, it's an R33. So damn, it's really not super insulated like you always hear about passive houses. And we're still able to make it work in the energy model. The importance of uh, air tightness, right? I think it's the importance of, of um, integrated design, right? Don't get prescriptive on that really look at how all of your elements work together. And that's why we do like really deep energy modeling rather than guesstimating and saying, oh, we're going to do a lot of this, but not very much of that and it'll be fine. I, you know, I'm always surprised why energy model, how, what the real outcomes are. It's, it's almost impossible to guess even with experience. So that's why we're quite careful. It means we also get thinner walls, which means we get fatter interior floor plate too. So they get more value uh, out of the living space. So, yeah. So that's the good news, right? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and there you can see the, the pitch on the garage roof in that picture. Yeah, um, you can cut it. Exactly. Um, so which of these energy efficiency features could be applied to existing homes? Uh, windows, air tightness are probably the first, like, basic things. Think of it as, like, your, your window, the double pane window is like an R3 but your walls in R13 or 19, right? All of a sudden you see, oh, that's a big difference. Just in just in total performance of the wall. So even putting in good windows over, over time and then the air tightness thing, that can be a significant uh, heat loss as well as can create damp, dampness in the walls from the cold air from outside condensing. And then, and then where do you, what's your filter screen for that? It's probably your insulation which is not great. So, and then provide a proper ventilation system in that. Um, but it's each house, each case is different. There's like, I don't want to, I don't want to do retrofits again in my life. They're, they're really hard. So um, it depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking to lower your bills, there's one way to do it. If you have some comfort issues, there's another way to do it. If you're trying to upgrade to all electric, there's probably another way to do it. So it depends on what your ambition is. Yeah. Okay. Is the cantilevered part over the entryway a potential heat loss area um, and or an ex extra expense to insulate around? Uh, it's not, it's, so this part is, and that's what we account for in the energy modeling. So our overall U value or R value of the entire building is increased ever so slightly but we're only talking about this little teeny chunk of floor here, right? Or ceiling, whatever you call it. This is this is just added. This is just a little bit more surface area. 
to the building. We already are, have thick floors, so adding a little bit of insulation, and then our two inches, you saw how little we needed for our walls, like an R30, and then adding that, um, that uh, mineral wool insulation on the outside, which is a good, which is two inches, which is a good eight, nine, R9 on top of that for the fire resilience. It, it hardly affects it. And it's a good way to create a protected space without adding a lot of complexity of structure to the building as well. And it gives a little bit, it, it's not like a blank face of wall you're looking at. It provides a little bit of more interest to the actual look of the building, we think. So that's the thinking okay. behind that. And that's Rob Harrison's good work. Excellent. Um, could you share what kind of maintenance the heat pump mini splits require? I know of none outside of, there's a little screen. So the way that I just installed this particular unit that we, that uh, we're using on our projects, uh, the Medea. And so um, I kind of understand it myself. And what, what happens is that this is just, this is, that's the outside unit. I don't know if the inside units on this page, it's not, but you've seen that they call them wall warts. So they're just units that are on the side of the wall and they're high wall units. And what they have is a big squirrel cage fan that runs at different volumes. And it's, that fan is running constantly. What it's doing is monitoring the temperature of the air by mixing it. And that tells it when it needs to throttle up or throttle down. And there's a screen that goes over that just to keep crap that comes out of it the, the, from the air from inside the house. Uh, it's just that filter media, which is very insignificant. It's not really filtering the air for human health. It's just keeping crap off the fan. So you pop that open every three or four months. If you have pets, maybe more often. Clean it out, wash it out, put it back on again. And you do the same with your HRV or ERV. You want to change your filters in that case. Uh, every three to four months and more often if we have like a large smoke events those filters can get pretty black so that's the in passive house in general all you're doing is changing filters everything else kind of just hums along in fact they tell you not to put a smart thermostat on these units uh, they really want to just be set set and forget for maximum efficiency they want to ramp up and ramp down really slowly as far as the energy efficiency if they go up suddenly and then go shut off suddenly and then turn on suddenly uh, that's when they use a significant amount more power to to start the coolants to get the compressor going all that stuff so they just want to hum along okay sounds good um why are some of the plumbing fixtures against outside walls uh because we can't Yeah, we have enough insulation. We're not worried about uh, having uh, most of my projects. We actually have what we call a mechanical wall or mechanical chase inside of the walls. And that's inside of the air barrier, inside of the significant part of the insulation layer. But um, when you have limited amount of area in the building, uh, you being able to use the exterior walls to run your plumbing uh, or your electrical often um, without having, in this case, it's more traditional framing, but it saves a lot of effort uh, for laying out um, how we can place utilities. Does that make sense? So yeah, we're not, we have enough insulation that it, will, it won't freeze. It's far enough inside the wall to be protected. Okay. Um... Have you considered using T studs in the framing? And thermal bridging is not a primary issue for us. Uh, we already do thermal breaks in the wall system. Uh, we do this. We can put T studs in, but like the value proposition, unless we need like really thin walls, we're not looking at much of a value upgrade from doing conventional framing and then a thermal break system. In this case, it's the outside insulation. And this this number here, see, if you see here, this is how we put in a wall system into the energy model. We put in the framing, and then we put the R value of the wood, and then we can put in the percentage of that 
say it's 10%. Let's say I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to put a T stud in. And let's say a T stud is the same R value as our insulation. So right now we're at 33.3 .3 for our wall, total wall. And I'm going to put in 3.7 R value per inch. And we get from 33 to 37 if we use like a T stud in this wall system. But then we have to go back and look at our verification. If we're already below our verification uh, for our total energy use, then we have to value, understand what the value engineering component of is. And then it's not just the, we need a thick wall to hold a lot of insulation too. So T studs may not be appropriate uh, for kind of wider wall assemblies, depending on the condition. So. Okay. Um, every building okay. different. I never built the same wall twice. Put it that way. How's that? Um, so, in terms of your standard design, um, how much PV would you put on that standard design, or can it accommodate, or does I that depend on? on I live off grid. I don't care about PV anymore. I'll just <laughs> take that grid power. I'll be happy. Um, how much would I put on? You put on as much as you can afford, you know, basically. There's no magic bullet to PV. It works when the sun shines. It doesn't work great in the winter. It works, it overproduces in the summer times. So it's really up to you um, on how much you want to invest in that. It's a, it's a good investment. I mean, I have panels that are 25 years old and working great. So, so um, they're definitely worth it in the long run. But if you're putting in PV rather than like putting in efficiency into your building, like and comfort, like if you're putting in good windows, like if you take your window budget and apply it to PV instead, then you just lost the idea of what comfortable building is. So you're an uncomfortable building that makes more electricity, right? That doesn't help you out. And from the carbon point of view, you may not actually be saving that much carbon, if if any at all, uh, by applying renewables before you look at the comfort and energy efficiency part, especially in the cold deep deepness of winter when we need the most renewables when the least available. That's when it really counts. So kind of my humble opinion, but yeah, it's all a balance. Can serve first. Um, okay, here's the next one. Um, would there be a way to have the garage access not require going through the Flex TV extra bedroom? So that's one floor plan. We have, I think, our updated floor plan is actually different from that, and it goes into a hallway. So we we are changing the floor plans for almost all the clients uh, based on their needs. So yes, I think our first project is not have i'll show you the floor plan if you want to see the floor plan i got the floor plan all right these are brand new fresh off the press uh construction documents so i have not actually gone through them okay that's the upstairs next sheet should be the downstairs there we go so yeah so in this case uh the garage goes into a hallway and then there's a media guest room coming off of that straight into the bathroom or the living room. So this is a little bit of a different different floor plan. Uh, and the upstairs as well. So this gives you a quick look on the downstairs space. And then for this project, the upstairs, oh, that's a, uh, no, that's the basement, of course. For the upstairs, uh, we did kind of bathroom layout that's pretty significant um, uh, master bath shared hallway uh, everything gets changed up quite a bit own laundry room corner bedroom this bedroom's kind of cool has a built-in nook for the uh, bed so so very 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 standard uh, type of layouts um, very adaptable the cell shape for all sorts of different kind of needs for people. And then that room, they'll come over here, will be uh, the next bedroom, uh, the, the fourth bedroom upstairs. So we can get uh, four bedrooms upstairs, 
one bedroom on the main floor if needed, and then two bedrooms in the basement to really cram people in. <laughs> okay, uh, next question. Do you have any thermal mass designed into the house? Uh, for example, extra thick wall board. Uh, thermal mass is, uh, so th again, that's, ex that's something that's almost impossible to energy model. Thermal mass is really beyond the scope of residential design. Um, and, and it has some level of impact, specific capacity. This is the thermal mass slide rule or calculator. It, but it's kind of crazy how in energy modeling, how little is understood on the dynamics of thermal mass that we can model it to a certain extent, but we really typically don't design for it in a heating climate. In a cooling climate, it makes more sense when you can kind of get rid of that excess heat from the day um, that that's stored up into the thermal mass. So we can do night flushing, but in cooling climates, it really doesn't help us that much. So um, it don't waste, you know, I learned my lesson, man, don't waste your money on lots of thermal mass. Uh, if you're in a heating climate, if you're looking to quote unquote store heat, it really doesn't do that well. And if you put in too much thermal mass, uh, which I discovered, and I think a lot of people discover this, is that once that thermal mass gets deloaded from that energy, it stays cold for the rest of the season. And then you actually are sucking heat off of your body and out of the room uh, rather than the thermal mass being productive for comfort. Okay. Um, have any of these houses been built yet? And if not, when or when do you expect they will be built? And will you do tours? Yes. Good question. Uh, we um, so we are finishing our construction document. Will we? We're in the reply mode. We're doing replies for our first set of construction documents now with the city um, of um, uh, Superior and uh, we will be breaking ground next month on our first project we only have one project guaranteed signed right now we have had a really hard time we've had lots of conversations but getting people to actually commit to passive house compared to your standard code builder has been much harder than we thought um, it's getting better now we're starting to get we have two people who, as i said are just re ready to sign uh, so we hope to get the first project done in November. Um, yes, we will be, that's almost like the agreement with the clients is that they have to show this house uh, to folks. Um, we're, you know, the house is going to be on television. It's going to be kind of all over the media, we suspect. So we've been putting a lot of work into the finishes and making sure that the house is going to be actually pretty, pretty, pretty nice. Uh, uh, as almost a model home in that sense. Uh, so yes, you'll be more invited and hopefully Chris can spread the word. Uh, CGBG will probably be hosting uh, a number of tours as well in the future. And we have, there's like four or five other passive houses that have broken ground now in the fire, but it's really slow. Like literally one client says, until the insurance company says we can like spend money, we can't do a damn thing. And that's been a lot of people are just now finishing the negotiations with their insurance company after a year. So it's been really stressful for people to get moving on these projects. Okay. Um, does cellulose insulation ever smell in a passive house? If it gets wet. So, but aside from that, no especially since it's going behind the air barrier, that you, you will never have any air exchange between the build, the interior and your insulation system. But definitely keep it dry. That's the secret. Um, okay, the next one. Um, I've always been a big proponent of attic ventilation. However, uh, uh, speculation that attic vents and eaves or elsewhere acted to suck in fire to the attic and added to the potential for the home to catch fire. Um, your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, the idea of attic ventilation, the building science behind it is yeah. sketchy. Um, the idea of attic ventilation was, of course, to dry out your roof because your roof gets super cold. Hey, when Andrew, you're, you're you're breaking up a little bit. Um, maybe yeah. if you turn off your video, it might give more uh, bandwidth sure. to what you're saying. Sure, maybe this helps. So, um, so attic ventilation is the hardest thing. It's been codified. And now it's become like how you build best practices. Uh, we're finding there's studies that showing that you can introduce as much vapor into your building as you get out of the building uh, with different ventilation strategies in different places. Uh, heat loading was a problem when you didn't have enough insulation in your building, so as to cool the roof down as well for like warranty purposes, things like that. But um, we're finding that like. The building science behind like high performance roof systems are looking looking more promising by having unventilated uh, roof systems generally, especially now that we have products that on top of the roof we're putting a product that's a sticky membrane, self healing membrane that's actually vapor open, so it's going to let any vapor build up inside the attic up through the top, and then we have the Intello at the bottom, which will let vapor out through the bottom, depending on what the vapor load is inside the roof system. So looking at kind of the new assemblies where we have vapor smart and vapor open, uh, but watertight and airtight assemblies, it's looking more and more defensible to do to, to unventilate our attic spaces. OK. Without getting um, like the deep side of night cooling, radiant cooling at night. I mean, it, it's just crazy amount of um, things that happen on the roof, thermodynamically, hydrostatically. Yeah. Okay. Um, question on um, not quite understanding how you're moving hot or cold air through the house using bathroom fans. Um, are you using insulated ductwork in the ceilings that feed hot and cold air from near the split system mounted wall units into the other rooms? How, how are you doing that? We're just mixing the air. We, we have a very low heat load or cooling load, very tiny cute cooling load. I think it's about 6,000 BTUs. So we just need a little bit of mixing on top of what we have with the HRV. We don't want to be reliant on our on our heat exchange unit for mixing. So all we're doing is we're we're we have a kind of slightly cool room and when the doors close for a bedroom, we want to still make sure that we get mixing into that room. We're not trying to we're not trying to like put a large load into the room and then overcool one space in and leave another space that's slightly out of balance. So passive house has low loads, low mixing. We up the cooling a little bit. We lower the cooling a little bit. We don't need to go crazy. And then if we have a particular difficult area, we can adjust and add a little bit more ventilation for each of those vent bedrooms using uh, the distribution system uh, that we just uh, start hopefully partnering up with a company that does uh, small, small, uh, flexible duct ventilation distribution systems. They do it for whole houses just for regular heating and cooling. So we'll be doing that just for pass pass. Okay. Um, what are the exterior materials for the walls and the roof? Uh, for finished materials, roof is going to be um, standing seam uh, metal. And then we're either going to use like a standing seam uh, or Corten steel uh, finish for the exterior walls or traditional, um, um, what do you call it, uh, fiber cement siding that can be in all types of applications. And all of that's being back vented. So we're, we're putting on purlin, so we're adding three quarter inch uh, wood that allows um, air to go up in the back of the siding or metal. So we got constantly having a drying out effect for it. 
Okay. Um, with the eight inch walls and extra insulation, can you talk about the quietness inside the house, um, separation from, you know, outside traffic or aircraft noise? Yeah, it's super quiet. That's, that's what's kind of fascinating is that noise moves, uh, noise moves not dissimilar to how heat moves. Like if you have little teeny gaps or membranes, uh, like say a double pane window, then it, you can get a lot of sound through that or, or uh, little gaps around uh, kind of conditioned corners where the windows meet, things like that. So, so the first offense is the air tightness. And the second offense is that insulation or that triple pane window system uh, in heavy frames. So you're getting high pitch noise and low pitch noise uh, pretty well um, buffered. And in fact, in New York, I think probably the biggest reason why the brownstone passive house movement happened was because of the sound, sound quality of passive houses. It wasn't about comfort, it wasn't about energy savings really, it was really about sound. At the end of the day, it was driving people in the city crazy, so. Okay, here's a suggestion. How about a greenhouse on the garage roof? <laughs> sure. Still connected to your passive house. The dog uses as a heating system for your passive house. That's all. I like it though. But they wouldn't, you know, God, these I I'm spoiled. I get to do custom mountain homes to work in these cities where they're like, you cannot have a deck on the roof. You cannot have people facing the street. It needs to look like a pristine, boring house. It's absolutely antisocial, the the code, in my personal opinion on how they want us to design these buildings. They don't want people to see each other from the street. It's, it's significantly depressing to us. The stuff we have to swap out from the building, the original building concept. It's anti-new urbanism. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, what is the ceiling height on each floor, including the basement? Uh, I believe basement's eight foot. Uh, the first floor is ten foot. The second floor is cathedral. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about the advanced framing? Uh, yeah. Oh, th that's a good question, and I didn't talk about that. Uh, Rob Harrison is really put a lot of time and effort over the years in advanced framing, and so what he's doing is he's doing. Uh, we're doing the eight inch studs on 24 inch center, and then we're doing uh, what they call California corners. So we're only using two studs in the corners, which uh, reduces the amount of wood and thermal bridging. And then he's doing things like um, uh, using uh, king and queen uh, jack studs and using uh, kind of using a share. I don't think we're in this project. Uh, sometimes we can use like a rimmed joist so we can spread the load over and don't have to have big headers for the windows and coordinating the spacing of the windows with the framing and making sure that the engineer understands exactly what the framing spacing is to eliminate uh, redundant framing inside the wall system, especially around spacing between windows, corners, things like that. So I'm not sure what the percentages of wood he's been able to save, but um, it was quite a bit of coordination between the architect and the structural engineer uh, for the framing of the building, which also saves us money, right? Uh, the framing will also be pre-cut. Uh, all of the studs will be cut before they come in sight and packaged and wrapped and labeled so that the framing crew will not be have a bunch of cutoffs on site and Hypothetically, they'll be saving wood uh, from the lumber yard. So we'll see how that goes. Almost like a Sears and Roebuck package house. You know, we're going, more things change. <laughs> um, where is the air exchange unit located? It's going to be in the basement. Okay. And there's room for a secondary air exchange for ventilation for the kitchen hood if requested, so that's an extra people can add. Um, is this designed only for the Marshall Fire area or are you interested in building, uh, you know, outside, obviously? 
other front we're, range. We're talking about that, I think the builder is open to that, especially along the front range. Um, we've had a couple of people asking about it, um, not necessarily following up. Um, of course, uh, a lot of the price was, of course, subsidized, uh, both in the time that the, the engineers put in a lot of time, the builders put in some discounts, I put discounts, and the architect put, put in discounts. So the pricing, I'm, I don't know what that would look like, um, but the house is ready to rock and roll, basically. I mean, it is designed to be for all kinds of lot conditions. So, yeah. So that's my long way of saying probably. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Use the old software adage, you know, uh, write once, read many, design <laughs> once, build many. Yeah, but yeah. it'll be, but it'll be a lot cooler than a, a Lennar version of that, right? I, you know, my guy, we're looking at some of these floor plans. They were just the biggest waste of space. I, that's the thing. A lot of people don't know how to look at floor plans. That's what I'm learning. Yeah, a lot of people don't know how to design a floor plan who work for these big builders. So, yeah. Oh, it's lipstick and some sort of not very attractive animal. Um, anyway, well, that seems to be the last of the questions. A lot of thank yous. And uh, yeah, definitely on behalf of, uh, of Crest, thank you as always for yet another great presentation. Hey, thank everyone for joining. Um, we'll have this out. Just oh. before I shut up, when I forgot one announcement is that uh, uh, Passive House Network is having the National uh, Passive House Conference in Denver in October, so in person. So just keep your eyes out if you're interested in really kind of meeting a lot of amazing Passive House people. Pretty much, in, it's pretty much an international conference at this point. So, so late October or early October, uh, check it out if you can. Fantastic. Well, we'll definitely uh, be sharing that in our uh, upcoming newsletters once the uh, the formal announcements is, is out. All right. Thanks again, Andrew. Good night, everyone. Yeah.